بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مثل الذين حملوا التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صل على محمد وآله the second one of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa al-Zaman Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh the battle of Safin is arguably the most difficult battle that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib had to ever face in his life. Indeed, you find that this battle was a battle in which Imam came face to face with an older adversary. When you look at the battle of Safin, you'll find that the battle was between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. The fact that these two names come together is somewhat unbelievable. Since when could Muawiyah come in the same sentence as Ali? Ali ibn Abi Talib, who had given and devoted his whole life to the religion of Islam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was the one raised in the lap of prophethood, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who fought Muawiyah's father through thick and thin when he saw him trying to attack the religion, now you found that Muawiyah had the same claim as Ali when it came to the religion of Islam. Indeed, recently there's been an attempt to revive the image of Muawiyah. Up until a few hundred years ago, whether you were Sunni or you were Shia, there was never any respect for Muawiyah whatsoever, as in whichever school you belong to, you would never find that there was any reverence for Muawiyah at all. Muawiyah was seen as the first of the kings. The caliphs had come before him, but he was always seen as a king. And at the same time, nobody in all the schools in Islam had a reverence to him in one way or the other. Now, today, you find that there's been a revamp of Muawiyah's image. Recently, you find that there have been a number of books published in Western academic circles, with the funding coming from one country in particular, to try and revamp, reform Muawiyah's image in Islamic history. The likes of Humphreys, the likes of Kish have written books recently to try and revive Muawiyah, to try and exonerate Muawiyah from any of the crimes that he and his Umayyad henchmen performed within the religion of Islam. Therefore, you found that the Battle of Safin was without a doubt one of the most important battles. It was shortly after the Battle of Jabal. Not only had Ali ibn Abi Talib just finished from one civil war, now there was a second civil war and a second group who wanted to fight him. Of course, the Battle of Safin is similar to the Battle of Jamal today in that many non-Shia do not want to talk about the issue at all. If you go to many Friday prayers in the Muslim world, you'll find Safin and Jamal are never mentioned. Why? Because once again there's a problem. Companions versus companions. The golden image of companions is burnt at Jamal and at Safin. Sometimes people imagine that the golden image of the companions was burnt at Jamal only. That Talha, Zubair and Aisha versus Ali burnt the whole image of the companions theory. Safin was somewhat worse. Why? Not only did you have the likes of Muawiyah and Amr ibn al-As fighting Ali and Ammar ibn Yasser, but you also had 70 people who were at the Battle of Badr with Rasulullah fighting each other. 
You had, for example, more than 200 who pledged under the tree to Rasulullah fighting each other. That theory that the companions of Rasulullah protected the religion of Islam is the biggest myth ever portrayed in Islamic history. Jamal showed that these still had rivalries, these still were antagonistic to each other, some of these absolutely hated each other, some of these envied each other. Therefore, when a person comes to the Battle of Safin, one finds the Battle of Safin, when they came and said the Battle of Jamal, many of our brothers and other schools in Islam, what do they say? The Battle of Jamal was a fitna. It happens. It's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence when you have a second group fighting Ali a few months later. Clearly, if it's happened once, someone could turn around and say, listen, accidents happen. Aisha, Talha, Zubair made a mistake. They, didn't, they did not, not like Ali ibn Abi Talib. Rather, there was an issue. But now, a few months later, another group comes to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib. As in Ali ibn Abi Talib was completely disrespected by many of these. And at Safin, it was revealed. Safin was different from Jamal in which way? Jamal finished in a few days. Safin finished in four months. Safin took four months as a battle. Jamal took three days as a battle. Safin, most of it was negotiations. In reality, there was only a few days of war. The most of Safin was negotiations. From the side of Muawiyah to the side of Ali, from the side of Ali to the side of Muawiyah. And the number of deaths at Safin is completely different to the number of deaths at Jamal. Jamal, let's say you had 10,000 deaths. Safin, you had over 50,000 Muslims killed. Yes? More than 50,000 Muslims were killed on that day. But amongst those who were killed, were certain pivotal figures who were the difference between Haq and Batil. The likes of Ammar bin Yasser, Khuzayma bin Thabit al-Ansari, Owais al-Qarani, companions of Rasulullah on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib who all were killed. Therefore today when I hear in Pakistan or I hear in India or I hear in parts of Africa that there are missionaries coming and saying Amir Muawiyah radiyallahu an fought Amir Ali radiyallahu an. Yes? You turn around and you say, what are you talking about? Who was with Ali? Ammar, Khuzayma, Owais? What did Rasulullah say about these companions with Ali? You see, sometimes if the people come and say, you Shia are biased on Ali, we say, okay, put Ali to the side. How about Owais? How about Khuzayma? How about Ammar? We'll see in this lecture what Rasulullah said about all of these and how the army of Muawiyah killed them. Therefore, let's try and tonight examine what's the context of what happened in the Battle of Safin. Jamal, most know, Aisha versus Ali. But what happened that led to Ali versus Muawiyah? And I'd like to examine this in the following stages. Number one, why did Imam Ali move his capital from Medina to Kufa? Number two, how did Muawiyah try to propose for Uthman's widow? And how did she reject his proposal? Number three, why was Muawiyah so certain he could defeat Ali? And which four countries were under him which no one could take from him? Number four, when Imam went towards Safin, how did the war begin and why did it begin with peaceful discussions? Number five, when the Imam was in charge of the Furat on the banks of Safin, why did Imam allow Muawiyah's army to drink from the water? And which principle did the Imam set even in the battlefield about the importance of water to a soldier? Number six, when Ammar died, how did that cause a problem for Muawiyah's army? And which hadith did they suddenly remember? Number seven, how did Muawiyah twist the hadith? Number eight, all of a sudden, when Malik al-Ashtar was about to finish Muawiyah, why did Amr ibn al-As say, let's put the Qur'ans on the spears and make it the judge? Number nine, how did the judgment take place? And how did it eventually lead to a group known as the Khawarij? Let me examine in order that we understand this unbelievable battle and the sadness of Islamic history. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's capital when he became Khalifa was Medina. Ahl al-Bayt had a special affiliation to the land of Medina. You will never find a family who loved Medina like Al Muhammad. Until today, you find that Al Muhammad's graves are there in Medina. But the Imam realized that when Aisha Talha and Zubair fought him, 
They wanted to make sure that they captured key cities. Of these cities was a city that until that time was about 19 years old. A city by the name of Kufa. Kufa was founded around the time of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, when he was a general of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He walked past an area which he felt would be a good area for the Muslims to settle in. Not settle to live, but rather a good garrison town for soldiers to live to stay in. Later, that Kufa became a center of the Islamic world. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib knew that not only had Aisha Talha and Zubair wanted Kufa, but Medina was not the best strategic place to be while Muawiyah was where? In Syria. So therefore, Imam knew if I go towards Kufa, I'm much closer to Muawiyah than I am in Medina. Because why? Because he knew about Muawiyah there were two things. The first thing he knew about Muawiyah was that Muawiyah wanted and put the claim out that I'm going to avenge the killers of Uthman. Muawiyah hadn't even helped Uthman when Uthman died, yes? Uthman had written to Muawiyah because he's his cousin. He wrote to him saying, I'm besieged in my palace. 49 days Uthman was besieged in his palace. He wrote to Muawiyah saying, Muawiyah, send me soldiers, you're my cousins. Muawiyah knew very well, you know what? Get this guy out of the way, I'm getting closer to what Muhammad thought I'll never get close to, yes? So Muawiyah sent his soldiers up until a certain period. He said, you don't move until I tell you. These soldiers waited. They waited until Uthman died. Muawiyah told them, all of you come back to where I am. When Uthman died, Muawiyah didn't even help Aisha or Talha or Zabar at Jabal. Muawiyah stayed back. Cleverly, he knew that I don't need to get involved in none of these. There'll be a time where I'll take on Ali ibn Abi Talib myself. And those of you who have been listening to my lectures from night one until now will know Muawiyah has an old price he wants Ali to pay from Badr, correct or no? And those of you who haven't, I ask you to refer to what I mean. Therefore, Muawiyah Imam knew, let me move my capital to Kufa. When I move to Kufa, I'll be able to counteract Muawiyah. I'll be able to make sure I'm in a strategic position. Some people ask, the people of Kufa, are they to be respected or no? Of course they are. Why not? If Ali ibn Abi Talib moves his people to a city, that means he believes the people of the city are good people. Today when you hear followers of Ali al-Bayt saying, the Kufans killed Imam al Hussein, or the Kufans let down Imam Ali, no doubt there are Kufans who were bad. Then there are Kufans like Habib ibn Madahir, Muslim ibn Awsaja. These are all Kufans. In any city, you have good or bad. That person who once came to me and said the Shia of Kufa, they are the ones who killed Imam al Hussein. I said they're better than the ones of Mecca and Medina who chased him out. Correct? Why are you attacking Kufa? Mecca and Medina chased Imam al Hussein out, didn't let him live. Who should the blame be on? Kufa or Mecca and Medina? Or is it because Mecca and Medina have certain companions you don't want to blame for Karbala? So you put all the blame on Kufa. Correct or no? Imam therefore felt. Kufa would be a great place to go. And now that the Imam had established his government, he went towards Kufa and he was sending people to get a bay'ah from Muawiyah. Muawiyah would not give a bay'ah to the Imam. Why? Muawiyah felt there's no need for me to give a bay'ah to Ali. I have a caliphate within a caliphate. In which way? Today, when I say to you Sham, what does Sham mean today? Syria, correct? Muawiyah, when he used to rule Sham, Sham wasn't Syria. Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan. Do you know how big that land is or no? Today, when we look at Sham, Sham is what? Sham today is Syria. In those days, Muawiyah, do you know who made Muawiyah governor of Sham? This is how Islamic history works. Wallah, if you want to unravel Islamic history, I'll open it up for you piece by piece. Muawiyah was made governor of Sham by Umar ibn al-Khattab. Yes? Umar ibn al-Khattab made him governor of Sham. And sometimes I begin to wonder, why are you giving Abu Sufyan's kids all these positions? Yes? I thought you loved Rasulullah, yes? A love of Rasulullah gives Abu Sufyan. First he gave Abu Sufyan's son Yazid. Abu Sufyan had a son called Yazid. Muawiyah named his son later after his uncle. Abu Sufyan had a son by the name of Yazid. They made him governor of Sham. When he died, Umar said, I appoint Muawiyah to be governor of Sham. And Bibi Zainab in her khutbah in Sham refers back to this, by the way. Those who paved the way for you to dominate over us. 
will soon find out whose army is weaker. But that I'll leave for another day. We don't want to get in too much trouble. Therefore, what you find, you find that Umar had appointed Muawiyah. Muawiyah had been governor of Sham for how many years? He had been governor 17 years. 20 AH till 37 AH. Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, all of them were his. You think Ali ibn Abi Talib poses a problem to him? He's the key. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali ibn Abi Talib has Kufa and Medina, and he still has people in his army he can't even trust. I have over 120,000 from Palestine, from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Syria. All willing to die for me. And I'll never forget Imam Ali's line. He said, give me one of Muawiyah. I'll give you ten of mine. Correct? Muawiyah's soldiers would do anything for him. Muawiyah, up until that day, had conquered Europe. There were areas of Constantinople. There were areas of Rome. There were areas of Africa. Muawiyah had conquered inside out. Do not think Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan is something small. Muawiyah, to challenge Ali. Do you know how much you have to think of yourself as a tactician? Muawiyah knew, I'm so powerful. Ali ibn Abi Talib wants bay'ah from me? Never! Let Ali ibn Abi Talib beg me for bay'ah. I am powerful where I am. And Muawiyah had the audacity, even after Uthman got killed, he put out the shirt of Uthman. You know, like in the Quran, the shirt of Yusuf. Everyone uses it as an excuse, correct or no? Muawiyah put the shirt of Uthman. He said, I want to avenge my cousin's death. Then he proposes in a letter to Uthman's wife, Naila. Uthman's wife, Naila, was a beautiful Arabian woman. Muawiyah kept writing letters to her. Marry me! Marry me! She keeps rejecting. Marry me! She keeps rejecting. One day she wrote back to him. She said, why do you want to marry me? He said, the beautiful pearl white teeth that you have, they entice me into wanting to marry you. You know what she did? She knocked out one of her tooth, put them in the envelope and sent it to Muawiyah. She said, hey, marry the tooth, yes? Because Naila knew Muawiyah never helped her husband. It was Ali who helped her husband, yes? Therefore, you found Muawiyah, there was no intention to avenge Uthman. What Muawiyah wanted was his position consolidated. And I tell you one thing, at the beginning, Muawiyah didn't want to go to war with Ali. At the beginning, Muawiyah said, if Ali gives me my land, I will let him be Khalifa and I'm Khalifa in my area. Walid bin Aqba, the one who, do you remember in Salat al-Fajr, he was drunk, he prayed four and a half nights ago, yes? Walid bin Aqba, advisor to Muawiyah, said, we will not call you one of Bani Umayyah if you let the son of Abu Talib rest in peace. You must make sure that you fight him. In other words, Muawiyah, if you looked at his chief advisors, one of them was who? One of them was Walid bin Aqba. Another, Samara bin Jundu. Another, Abu Huraira. Another was who? Sir John the Roman. Muawiyah started bringing Christians in. Remember when Yazid wants to appoint someone for Kufa, he asked Sir John, who should I appoint? And Sir John says, if your dad was alive, he would put Ibn Ziyad in Kufa. That Sir John the Roman was Muawiyah's advisor. In other words, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was not a Khalifa who was facing normal enemies. When Imam became Khalifa, Muawiyah was ready and Muawiyah was making inroads. He, um, Imam had made Kumail ibn Ziyad, who we named Dua Kumail after. He made him governor of an area called Heat in Iraq. Muawiyah would send people to cause disruption there. He'd send spies elsewhere. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib realized, if I let this Muawiyah continue, then this religion will divide and this religion will fall. Therefore, the Imam decided we're going to set out. Muawiyah is where? Sham. Imam is where? Kufa. We're going to set out and we'll meet Muawiyah on the way. In which area? Safin. Safin was between Iraq and Sham. Today, it's in Sham in Syria. But in that time, with the way the map was, it was between Iraq and Syria on the banks of the Forat, yes? Literally on the river Forat, because you know the river Forat goes from Iraq, one of the places goes to Syria. On the banks of the Forat, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib left Kufa. He put Aqaba, son of Amr, in charge of Kufa. He called Ibn Abbas from Basra, he said, come with me. And he took with him more than 80,000 soldiers to Safin, yes? Because Kufa was in his hands, Medina was in his hands, he had 80,000. Muawiyah said, you bring 80, we'll bring 120 with us, yes? and we'll bring the most ferocious of warriors. In Imam's army, he took some of the greatest of the warriors, yes? Imam took with him Ammar bin Yasser, but now Ammar bin Yasser is in his old age, yes? He's coming close to the 90s. 
Therefore, he took Ammar, he took Khuzayma bin Thabit, he took with him Owais al Qarani, he took with him Hashim bin Marqal ibn Tayyan, he took with him Imam al Hassan. Imam al Hassan, up until that day, was how old? 34 years of age, yes? He took with him Imam al Hussein, 33, and he took with him a younger man than them, yes? They had a younger br a brother by the name of Abu al Fadl, yes? Abbas, son of Ali, was only a young man on that day. He took with him as well. He took all of them together. They went towards Safin. When they reached Safin, Muawiyah's army straight away did what? Muawiyah's army straight away captured the Furad. So Ali's army dies thirsty with no water. Now you know very well, if there's a battlefield and you can't get access to the Furad, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that your soldiers will eventually die of thirst. Imam first asked them, he said, let us gain access. We have not come to fight. First, let's discuss peacefully. The battle and the peaceful discussions began at the end of 36 AH, yes? Imam came, he said, give us some of the water. Muawiyah said, never. The water of the Farad belongs to us. Imam Ali bin Talib turned around to his soldiers. You can see the sermon in Nahj al which I'm sure many of you have read. Imam turned around to his soldiers. He said to them, are you going to accept what they say? That the water belongs to them. He gave them a rallying cry. Sa'sa'a bin Suhan, Malik al-Ashtar. They managed to get the water of the Farad in their hands. Now Muawiyah's side, no water. Imam Ali ibn Talib's side, the water's all with them. Suddenly Muawiyah's army, a few days later, thirsty. No water to drink. And they began to ask themselves, we should have given Ali water. Because now we have no water to drink and he's not going to give us any. You know what Amr ibn al As said to them? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib will not reject you drinking water. Yes? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib is not the type of human being who rejects a thirsty human being. Go and ask him and see. Subhanallah, sometimes the shaitan tells you about purity, correct or no? Amr ibn al As told them, and you found that they came to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said to him, that we, the soldiers of Muawiyah, are thirsty. Can we drink some of the water of the Farad? Imam turned to his soldiers. He said to them, what do you think we should do? They said, but they never allowed us to drink. Imam said, no. Water is the right for everyone, every human and every animal. I cannot bear to see a horse thirsty, let alone a human being. Yes. As in these are the manners of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Wallah, which man? You take water away from him, then he gives water back to his enemies. He says, you come, you drink from this water, feel free. The same people who've come to kill him. As in, isn't his son the same in Karbala or no? You found therefore that Imam allowed them to drink. Then there was a few exchanges between the armies. Hujr bin Adi began to curse Muawiyah. He started to use foul language. And then Imam turned around to him and said, I don't like for my army to be of those who use cursing in this war. Yes? If you want to bring out what they have done, say what their faults are, but do not be the people of Seb. You see, Seb in English means what? Cursing, yes? Yes, it is Muawiyah. Yes, it's Amr ibn As. But I don't like you using derogatory remarks in Najib Balagha. There's a whole sermon that I hate seeing. It hurts me to see a group of people commit Seb. Sab is different from la'na. La'na is a dua, asking Allah. Sab is using foul language. Imam said no follower of Ahl al-Bayt should be someone who uses foul language against any of these. At the end of the day, you have a problem with Muawiyah, don't come out and curse. Come out and say X, Y, Z, this is the issues. Therefore, the negotiations went on back and forth until Muharram came. In Arabia, did they used to fight in Muharram or no? No. Why not? Because the Arabs used to have four months where they don't fight. What are the four months? Muharram, Rajab, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah. Four months in the Quran, we call them Al Ashhur Al Haram. Yes? Faidan Salah Al Ashhur Al Haram. Yes? The four sacred months, no Arab would fight another Arab. Subhanallah, who broke it? Yes? In that Muharram, there was a peace. One month. Imam said, listen, O oh, Amir Muawiyah, backtrack on what you are doing. This is not your leader. This man's an illegitimate ruler. This man has no interest in the religion of Islam. They turned around, he gave them a month. He said, in this month, Muharram, none of us will fight. We the Arabs, and Rasulullah never stopped this. Rasulullah said, this is great what the Arabs do. Have four months where you don't fight each other. 
They reflected. They came back on Safar. They came to them. Said, have you reflected? Shouldn't we have peace? They said, no. We are ready to fight. Muawiyah knew that the best option for him was to fight, not peace. Because otherwise he'd lose his position. Therefore, Imam Sannam ibn al-Harith ibn al-Harith came to them. He said, we offered you peace. But you don't want the peace. Therefore, let us come together and fight. Yes? Muawiyah's army, who were the main soldiers? The main soldiers were the likes of Muawiyah, Amr ibn al-As. But remember, these are nothing in comparison to Imam Ali's army. Imam Ali's army, who are the soldiers? Ammar bin Yasser, Rasulullah had said a hadith, which Muawiyah's army remembers later. Rasulullah praised Ammar. Khuzayma bin Thabit, who Rasulullah said, one of his witnessing is worth two in Islam, yes? That's why they call him Dhul Shahadatayn, yes? You had Uwais al-Qarani, who Rasulullah would say, Uwais al-Qarani, where he goes, I smell the fragrance of Jannah from Uwais al-Qarani, yes? Ali ibn Abi Talib, his soldiers were the greatest of soldiers. When the war began, Imam was at the front. He said, I am Ali, son of Abu Talib, commander of the armed forces. To my right, Ibn Abbas. To my left, Malik al-Ashtar, the standard bearer, Ammar bin Yasser. To his right, Hassan bin Ali. To his left, Hussein bin Ali. Behind them, Uwais al-Qarani, Hujr bin Hadi, Hani bin Urwa, Muslim bin Awsaja, Muqta, every single one, they're all in that ferocious army. All of them are present. Imam Ali ibn Talib said, are you ready? The Imam, the first thing he said is, why doesn't Muawiyah come out and fight me one on one? So I do to him what I done to his granddad on the day of Badr. Wow. Wow. See what he said? At Badr, Hind, her father, Ujba bin Rabi'ah, came out to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib and her brother Walid. Muawiyah, where are you? Do you forget what I did to your granddad at Badr? Come out so I do it to you as well. Where are you? Come out and face me. No answer. Ali ibn Abi Talib came back. The Muawiyah sends out someone saying, we'll not fight if Ali ibn Abi Talib comes out to fight. Not if it's a war or you're having a dinner meal. Yes? What do you mean we won't come out? He said, if Ali ibn Abi Talib comes out, we're not going to fight. Imam Ali therefore wore a mask. He came out again. Muawiyah ended, uh, stopped the war again. What's the issue? He said, that's Ali ibn Abi Talib behind the mask. He said, how? He said, the only man in Islamic history who's able to strike a human in half is Ali ibn Abi Talib with one strike. Yes? That sword that he has is a clear sword. Again, they retreated. Again, what happened? One of Muawiyah's soldiers was this man undefeated in war. He came out. He said, where is Ali ibn Abi Talib? Let him fight me one on one. Imam, who was next to him? Hazrat Abbas was next to him. Abu al Fad at that day was a young man. Imam called him. He said, Abbas, come to me. He said, yes. He said, I want you to wear a mask. I want to introduce you on the battlefield now. So he said to him, Father, I'm ready for the introduction. He said to him, go out now in front of Muawiyah's army. Go out and fight. Go out to fight now in Muawiyah's army. I want you to fight them. Don't introduce yourself until I tell you. So he came out. He's got a mask. He's on his horse. He turned around. They said to him, fighter, name yourself. Because you know you have to name yourself when you come out. He turned around to his father. His father said, no. He said, name yourself. He turned around to his father. His father said, no. He said on the third time, they said to him, name yourself. He looked to his father and said, tell them who you are. He removed the mask from his face and he said, Ana Qamar Bani Hashim, Abu Fadl al-Abbas. I'm the moon of Bani Hashim, Abu Fadl al-Abbas. The reply from Muawiyah's army was a phenomenal reply. They said there's already two moons in Muhammad's army, Hassan and Hussein. Yes, it's an interesting reply. He said, yes. They are the sons of Muhammad. I am the son of Ali. It's the role of the son of Ali to protect the sons of Muhammad. Ali! 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 And they are, the, they are the eyes of Ali. And I am the hands. It's the role of the hands to always protect the eyes. He annihilated what come in his way. Ibn Abbas one way. Malik al Ashur another. Ammar bin Yasser came out with a cry on that day, even though he was the oldest person there. He said to them, my friends, my friends, attack. Today is not a day to be lingering or hesitant. 
I see the gates of Jannah opening up for me. But the condition is you pick up your spears and swords and break the skulls of that opposition, that enemy of Rasulullah, him and his family, and go out and finish them. Jannah awaits each one of you. Ammar bin Yasser went through them. Then he looked at Amr bin al-As. He said, oh son of al-As, you sell your religion so that Egypt is yours. Because he wanted Egypt back for him, yes? Uthman had sacked him twice from Egypt. You sell your religion for Egypt. Do you not remember Rasulullah saying, Ammar, Ammar, you will be killed by infidels. Don't you remember that I'll be killed by infidels? He turned around to the soldiers, each one of them going their own way. He turned around to them and he said to them, I'm thirsty, give me something to drink. They gave him milk. As soon as he drank it, you know what he said? Allah, I see the gates of Jannah. Rasulullah told me my last act would be to drink milk before I die. Come, bring Jannah towards me. They hurled the javelin into the chest of Ammar bin Yasser. Ammar bin Yasser, whose mother and father were the first martyrs in Islam. If that's not enough for you to know where Haq is, then tell me what is, correct or no? They came out, he fell on the ground. Imam came and sat by his side. Do you know what happened in Muawiyah's army? Suddenly Muawiyah's army started to, to look at each other. What is it? He said, hold on, hold on. Now we know who's on Haq. He said, what do you mean? He said, Rasulullah said, Ammar will be killed by infidels. We've just killed Ammar. Subhanallah, do you know what I find funny about this whole thing? Fighting Ali is no problem, yes? It's only when we remember Ammar, yes, now we're wrong. <laughs> Fighting Ali and Abi Talib, no problem. Doesn't matter, yes? Ammar dies, oh, oh, by the way, we might be wrong. I thought Ali and Abi is your fourth Khalifa, for goodness sake. You fight your fourth Khalifa, you still like the people? Yes? Therefore you found when Ammar died, they came to Muawiyah. Muawiyah said, what's the issue? When Ammar died, they said to him, we have a problem. He said, there's a hadith of Rasulullah. What's the hadith? Ammar will be killed by infidels, therefore our army is infidels. Muawiyah said, don't worry, don't worry. He said, what do you mean don't worry? He said, we're not to blame. He said, why? He said, it's not us who killed Ammar. Ali ibn Abi Talib killed Ammar. So what do you mean? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib brought Ammar to war. That means he killed him. Imam replied with a lovely reply. He said, that means Rasulullah killed Hamza because he brought Hamza to war. Yes? Therefore, you found that the opposition were in trouble. Muawiyah knew there's a problem. And then came a moment I'll never forget. Uwais al-Khanani died. Khuzayma died. Ammar died. Imam Ali turns around to Malik al-Ashtar. He said, Malik, are you ready? Me and you go through them alone and we'll get to Muawiyah. Malik turned around to him. He said to him, yes, I'm ready. Shall we go? He said, let's go. The two of them in two days of fighting absolutely annihilated half of Muawiyah's army. Yes, by themselves. There was a moment while they're fighting, Malik shouts to Imam Ali, he says to him, I've killed the same number as you. He said, how do you know? He said, because every time you kill someone, you say Allahu Akbar. And while I've been killing, I've been saying the same and I'm on the same number as you right now. Imam Ali turned around to me and said, Malik, there's a difference between who you kill and who I kill. He said to him, what's the difference? He said, you kill anyone who comes in your way from the opposition. I look seven generations down the line. If there's a good human being in them, then I will not kill that human being. Allahu Akbar. Ali ibn Abi Talib. Yes. If there's a good human in seven generations down the line of that person, I won't kill him. Because seven generations down the line, there could be a good human arise from that person. Yes. They were going. Malik said, then I'll go ahead of you. Malik went out of the Imam. Imam was at the back. Imam is watching Malik go through them. Imam got to Amr ibn al-As. When Imam got to Amr ibn al-As, he was fighting him. Amr ibn al-As fell on the ground. Imam was about to strike him. Amr ibn al-As dropped his trousers. Wallah. He dropped his trousers. He knew that Ali ibn Abi Talib, the best way to make sure he doesn't kill you is to make sure that you do this so he turns away. Because Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't kill a person when he angers him, correct? Like in Khandaq. He'll walk away. Amr ibn al-As, who in Egypt today, Wallah, I feel sorry for some Muslims. If you look at the size of Amr ibn al-As mosque in Cairo, yes? It's like a whole shopping mall they built for Amr ibn al-As. A person who drops his trousers in war has a mosque that big, yes? Imam saw Amr ibn al-As on the ground. Malik was now two rows away from Muawiyah. Malik was sure. It's over. I could see Muawiyah in my sight. Muawiyah turned to Amr ibn al-As who had scampered back. 
My eyes are too much like you. I'll give you Egypt. I'll give you what I want. We're in trouble. Amr al said, stick every Quran we bought with us on the spears. They had bought a few Qurans with them. They stuck the Qurans on the spears and they came out. Oh, army of Ali, let us judge by the Quran who's right, Muawiyah or Ali. Why did they say that? They knew there's a few people in Imam Ali's army they'd paint off already. Yes? All they need to do is promise them that, listen, we'll give you land, we'll give you whatever, just agree to what we do. Having paid off Al-Ash'ath bin Qais and the likes of Abu Musa Al-Ash'ari and people like this, they came out, all of a sudden, Imam Ali's army came to him. Yes, the Qur'an should be our judge. Imam said, but I'm the walking Qur'an. I'm the one leading you. They said, no, Muawiyah is right. Let the Qur'an make the decision between Ali and Muawiyah. What do you mean let Muawiyah? Since when did Muawiyah know anything about the Qur'an? All of a sudden, Imam turned, Malik said, yes, come back. Said, what do you mean, come back? This was one of the most difficult moments for Malik al-Ashtar and his relationship with Imam Ali. He says, I see Muawiyah in front of me. He said, come back. The Malik came back and said, what is it? When are you done? He said, Malik, relax yourself and calm down. He said to him that we are mutiny in our own army. Muawiyah paid off some in our army, promising them lands, promising them bribes. If we now continue to fight, our own army is going to fight us. Come back. Muawiyah turned around and he said, very well, we're going to have an arbitration. We have an arbitration that decides. Imam turned around and said, you listen to this man. Believe me, this man is not meaning the best for you. He has no intention of looking after you. They said, no. Muawiyah said, the Quran judges, we're going to go with the Quran now. Not you and not Muawiyah. So you know what they did? They started to choose who the arbitrators will be. Muawiyah, from having been on the pits of defeat, on the clangs of defeat, now what happens? The jaws of defeat, now he's finished. Now he sees, you know what? Arbitration is the best way out of here. They tell Muawiyah, who do you want to be the arbitrator? He said, I want Amr ibn al-As. Imam Ali, who do you want? He said, I want Ibn Abbas. They said, we don't want Ibn Abbas. His own army said to him. He said, who do you want? He said, we want, he said, I want Malik al-Ashtar. We don't want Malik al-Ashtar. He said, then who do you want? He said, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. I'm offering you Malik ibn Abbas. They said, no, we want Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Amr ibn al-As said, Abu Musa, come here next to me. Amr ibn al-As, cunning of the cunning, yes? He called Abu Musa, he said, Abu Musa, I want you to lead us in namaz. He said, me? He said, yes. He said, you want me to lead you? He said, yes, you, you are Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. He led in namaz, then afterwards he said, we make an arbitration agreement. They came together, he began writing the arbitration agreement in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. This is an arbitration between Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Talib, oh, wait, wait, Amr al-As said, what are you doing? He said, Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, what do you mean Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, which Amir al-Mu'mineen? To me, he's not Amir al-Mu'mineen. And that reminds you of what? Reminds you of the day of Hudaybiyah when Imam Ali had to rub out, yes? And Rasulullah said to him, there'll be a day you have to do the same. He had to rub out Amir al-Mu'mineen. They came together, they decided a truce would be done. Which truce? The truce would be that for six months, these two arbitrators will decide who is right and who is wrong. They're going to investigate the death of Uthman. What a wicked world this world is. Wallah. Ali ibn Abi Talib who tried to help Uthman. None of these came to help Uthman. Amr ibn al-As hated Uthman. Amr ibn al-As hated Uthman. He sacked him twice as governor of Egypt. Twice. Now Amr ibn al-As is in charge of investigating which people killed Uthman. They came with the truth. We're going to investigate according to the book of Allah who's right. You're leaving the man who was brought up next to the book of Allah. Brought up, he's the first to hear the wahi with Rasulullah when he was a child. And you go to the man whose father and mother were chewing the liver of Hamza. Yes, is that what you go to? We choose by the book of Allah. We have an arbitration. The arbitrators are allowed to walk around the state in peace. No one can interrupt wherever they want to go. And then we find the killers of Uthman. Amr ibn al-As looked at Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. He said to him, Abu Musa, what do you think of all of this? And we're going to meet in six months time in the land between Iraq and Syria. 
How do I going to give the decision? When they came to arbitrate, they had this discussion with each other. Amr ibn al-As came. He said to him, Abu Musa, what do you think? I'm going to leave Muawiyah. You leave Ali. And we'll make our own thing. And we'll announce it to the public. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, you know what? That's a good idea. Let's do it. At that moment, they came out to the public. They had done their truce. They had done their arbitration. Amr ibn al-As said to him, listen, I'm going to leave Muawiyah. You leave Ali. We'll take our own thing. They came out to the public. When they came out to the public, what happened? They came out, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, Oh people, we have an announcement to make. He said, what's the announcement? said, I have left Ali ibn Abi Talib in his path. Amr al-As, please announce yourself. Amr al-As turned around, and I have stuck to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Yes, that's where my loyalty is. Abu Musa looked at him. He said to him, you are like the dog. You know in the Quran, مَثَلَهُ كَمَثَلِ الْكَلْبِ Yes? You are like the dog, whatever you give it, it works its tail. He turned around to him with a lovely line. He said, I'm like the dog, but you're like the donkey. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ أَسْفَارَ He said, I'm a dog. You're that donkey that carries luggage. You have Ali ibn Abi Talib as a leader, you come and discuss with me how stupid you are as a human being. SubhanAllah. Amr ibn al-As tells him, you're stupid. Ali ibn Abi Talib is your leader. You come and ask me. You really think that I'm brighter than Ali ibn Abi Talib? Look at you people. You carry Ali like a donkey carries luggage. You have no respect for the man. That's what you deserve. A group, when they found out that they had been conned by Muawiyah, because what Muawiyah did, he managed to get back to Syria. Now he's happy. Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan. He pulled the biggest con scam ever. And I'll tell you something. They came to Imam Ali, they said, Muawiyah is a better politician than you. They said, Muawiyah is a better politician than Ali. He said, if it wasn't for taqwa, I'd be the most astute politician. But I have taqwa, that man's a liar, he's a briber, deceit. That man's corrupt. You want me to be a politician with corruption? I can, but I have taqwa. There's a day I'll be asked by Allah about what I've done. Muawiyah was not better than Ali politically. Muawiyah bribed his way to where he wanted. And you know what he did to Imam Ali's army? He promised them, listen, you, I'll give you land. You, I'll give you money. You, I'll give you houses. When he went back to Syria, he stuck two fingers up at all of them. He said to all of them, all of you think that you are able to do what? All of you think that you're able to be there. And you think that I'm going to be someone who's going to look after you. Wallah, I won't look after any of you. All of you could go and suffer. They came back to Imam Ali. Subhanallah. His soldiers came back to Imam Ali. Ali, let's fight. He said, what do you mean let's fight? He said, let's fight. Muawiyah is broken. He said, I told you what Muawiyah was planning. Malik al-Ashtar was two rows away. And you rejected what we were doing. They said, we're going to fight. And if you don't fight, we'll kill you and Muawiyah. He said, what? He said, we'll kill you and Muawiyah. He said, you're my soldiers and you want to turn against me? They said, yes, Muawiyah conned us. He said, but I never conned you. I told you to listen to me, you didn't. I'm the imam of your time. Muawiyah killed Ammar bin Yasser. Rasulullah said, infidels will kill him. Muawiyah killed Khuzayma. Muawiyah killed Uwais. Muawiyah fought Hassan and Hussein. That's not enough for you. You listen to Muawiyah and then after that you come to me and you say now Muawiyah's conduct, let's go back and fight him. They said, you know what, if you're not ready to fight him, then we'll kill you as well. And that's where the famous battle which we'll discuss soon came out, the battle of Nahrawan, yes? When his own soldiers turned against him. And you found Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib could not believe the way had, the world had turned against him now, yes? Now the son of Hind sits in a more powerful position than the son of Abu Talib. Now the one whose mother chewed the liver of the nobles, born from the flesh of the martyrs, now he was firmly in charge of Syria, Palestine, Lebanon and Jordan. Instead of them listening to Rasulullah saying to them Ali was chosen on the day of Ghadir, you found them neglecting that. They had one civil war called Jamal and another civil war called Safin, and now more civil wars were to come. 
But did Safin affect the integrity of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib? Not one bit, no. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's integrity never wavers. Whether it's in war or outside of war, he never changes in his integrity. Look at him when it came to the Furat. Did he block them from drinking water from the Furat or no? Even though they were his enemies, he never blocked them from drinking water. Did he block Ibn Muljam from drinking water when Ibn Muljam killed him? He never. He said, give Ibn Muljam water, yes? The man might be thirsty. The man who gives water to his enemies from the Farad, only within 24 years, his grandchild, a six-month-old baby, receives no water from the Farad whatsoever. His son receives no water. His daughters receive no water. Oh, Farad, the water that you used to serve from the hands of Ali ibn Abi Talib, how did you block from the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib? I tell you, some of those children would come towards their mothers. Others come towards their aunties. Others would come towards their fathers. Yes, Sukaina says, I will not drink water until my father drinks water. Yes, Zayna will not drink water. Even Abba Abdullah, when he was in his last moment, said, my horse, you drink water. I can't drink until my horse drinks water. Yes, the horse wanted Abba Abdullah to drink, but Abba Abdullah was like his father. He couldn't bear to see a creation of Allah thirsty, yes? That's the integrity of Al Muhammad, the honor of Al Muhammad. But I tell you, of all of them who couldn't drink water, how could you leave a baby without water, yes? And that's why Rabab couldn't bear to take the six-month-old to Imam al Hussein. She gave it to Imam to Bibi Zainab. She said, Oh Zainab, that I can't hear any more groaning even from the baby, yes? Before I could hear the baby crying. Now I can't even hear the baby crying anymore. So Sayyidina Zainab came to Imam al Hussein. She said, Abba Abdullah, the mother couldn't bear to see the baby in this way. She couldn't bear to hurt you by bringing the baby. Baby. Imam took that baby, the six month old, yes? He brought him out onto the battlefield. He said to the Mawam of Umar bin Sa'ad, if you want to kill me, kill me. But what crime has this baby, you baby done, yes? The Farad is next to you. Bring some water for the baby. No one responded. Then he left the baby on the ground. He said, I'll leave him here. I won't come near him. You come and take the baby. No response. The third time he picked him up. Nobody describes what happened the third time better than Mukhtar al Thaqafi. Mukhtar met Harmala bin Kahil, yes? A few years after Karbala, he said to him, Harbala, on the 10th of Muharram, how many arrows did you shoot? He said, I shot seven arrows towards the army of Hussein. He said to him, how many shot their target? He said, four. Three of them missed. He said, which four did you shoot? He said, the first arrow I shot on the right eye of Abba al-Fadl al-Abbas when he was on his horse near the Furat. He said, we had cut the right and the left hand. And then Umar bin Sa'ad said to me, finish Abbas's eyes. So I struck the eye of Abba al-Fadl with my arrow. Then he looked at him. He said to him, okay, how about the second arrow? He said to him, the second arrow, I Shot was the nephew of Hussein, the son of Hassan by the name of Abdullah. He said to him, Hassan was uh, Hussein was on the ground, arrows all over him. He looked like a hedgehog. Abba Abdullah looked like a hedgehog, yes. He said he looked like a hedgehog. He said that I saw him on the ground. Then all of a sudden, a young boy ran out of the tent. His auntie Zainab said, come back to me, O oh son of my brother. He said to her auntie, how can I come back when Abba Abdullah is alone? He came and sat by the body of his uncle. I struck him. He fell there, his uncle, yes? He said to him, how about the third arrow? He said, the third arrow is the one that hurts me the most. He said, the third arrow I shot onto the neck of the six month old. <laughs> he said I shot the third. He said I shot the third arrow onto the neck of the six month old. He said I saw the baby flap its hands like a bird flaps its wings. Yes, and that's what happened to Rabab's child. And then he said to him, "How about the fourth arrow?" He said, "The fourth I shot onto the chest of Abba Abdullah." إِنَّا لِلَّهُ وَإِنَّا لَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ
We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asli wa Zaman. Ya Allah, bless us that we're able to protect the wilaya of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Ya Allah, allow us to visit the grave of Imam Amir al Mu'minin in the land of Najaf. Allow our cheeks to rub on the cheeks of on the grave of Imam Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam. Ya Allah, allow these eyes to see the grave of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Ya Allah, unite the Muslim Ummah on the love of, of Imam Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our brothers around the Islamic world, but especially our brothers in Iraq. Ya Allah, bring them peace and prosperity. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our ill ones at the moment. Our beloved Hajj Saftar, Hajj Abdul Hussein, our sister Kubra in London. Ya Allah, bring them peace and prosperity and remove all of the trials that they face with their illness with the following ayah of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma yujibu al-mustar ida da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su'ah. Amma yujibu al-mustar ida da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su'ah. Ya Allah, we beg you, we show that we're begging. Amma yujibu al-mustar ida da'ahu. ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala Imam Zain al Abidin cure all of our loved ones we pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى with the Surah al Fatiha but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Oh,